Buonasera a tutti, eh, benvenuti all'Accademia uh, Britannica qui a Roma, eh, sono Steve Milner, il direttore, e voglio dare un caloroso benvenuto a tutti quanti per questa sera e l'intervento di Professor Peter Berg. It gives me, uh, rather selfishly, tremendous personal pleasure to welcome Peter uh, this evening um, and also um, Ma Maria Luthier. Uh, who's also joined him uh, today at the BSR. The simple facts of the matter is, for good or ill, that if it wasn't for Peter, I wouldn't be here. Um, Peter taught me as an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge and was the catalyst for probably one of my finest Freudian slips. I've never told you this, Peter. Um, but I was talking to somebody about Peter's teaching and inspiration as a, as a, a magister and uh, instead of saying that he was a gold mine of information, I said he was a minefield of information, <laughs> <laughs> which reflects the catalytic effect that I think Peter has on people who are fortunate enough, whether as undergraduates or as postgraduates, to be taught by him, or more senior scholars or early career research fellows in managing to pin him down for some serious conversation about their work. There is not much about which Peter does not know or does not have an angle or a perspective to add, which sends one away slightly changed, slightly curious, and asking slightly different questions than you thought you arrived with. So when I was a, an undergraduate and taught by Peter, it was always a narrow line between excitement and intimidation. Um, I always think it's a sign of a, a very kind of cultured um, and uh, uh, curious in the right way mind to have a large table in your office on which you have recently purchased or received publications in multiple languages. Um, and I remember Peter, without any sense of, of irony, saying that after you've learned the first six languages, the others come relatively quickly. Um, which again, I think, reflects upon something we'll hear about this evening, this notion of, of the polymath. Peter has been publishing huge amounts <laughs> um, since the early 1970s, if not actually before then. Um, even a, a cursory check on that um, uh, polymaths playground, which is Wikipedia, it says, amongst Peter's most significant publications are, and there follow 23 books. So these, these are the most significant, of course. Uh, uh, but it's a, it's a huge output covering a huge um, series and, uh, of areas and competencies. But with a particular focus, I think, which is kind of runs through Peter's output on the kind of interrelationship between uh, language, um, sociology, um, historiography. I, I, I did Peter's final year option at the University of Cambridge on world historiography. And there were only four of us that took the course, but three of us ended up teaching in universities. Um, and it was just an absolute pleasure uh, to do that course. I don't think I would have, I don't think there are many people now who read Paolo Sarpi as part of their undergraduate um, uh, career. Um, but it was, a, again, it was a, a transformative moment in terms of opening up to me, anyway, the, the world of the Italian Renaissance. And it was Peter who encouraged me um, to go on to the Warburg Institute, uh, where I did my PhD uh, under the guidance of um, Michael Baxendall and, um, and David Chambers. So there's, all, there's always been this perennial engagement with thinking about ways of writing about history. Um, and Peter's remained, and I almost have a, a section of my own library, which is Peter's outputs. And then he very kindly, when he retired from, um, from Cambridge, but remained a fellow at Emmanuel, um, asked me to come and uh, take some books off his shelves, uh, which I still have as part of my library, which I think is a quintessentially Renaissance thing to kind of give part of your books onto the younger generation, which I look forward to in turn of handing on to the next generation. And we can add our signatures as we go down uh, through the generations. So books that fundamentally ask questions that one always needs to ask oneself, but sometimes never dare ask, like what is cultural history? Um, actually calling a book what is cultural history is fantastic. Cultural hybridity, again, things about which one needs to know 
and very often revealing a historical genealogy which is much longer than one thought about these issues um, uh, in ho historiographical terms. Um, a conservative historiography, the fantastic work on the, on the French historiographical tradition and the Annales School, again, of thinking about ways of, 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 of writing history, of going about the craft of the historian, um, have been incredibly suggestive. And a constant preoccupation with, with, with media, um, with, with forms of representation and ways in which people have represented um, the past or invented the present through the prisms of selected pasts um, have been an ongoing concern. So it, it really is, Peter, a, an absolute honour and I'm absolutely delighted that you accepted the invitation within relatively short measure uh, of my appointment to come and give us a lecture tonight. So uh, I'd like you all to welcome um, Peter Burke to the podium. Thank you. So thank you, Steve, for that generous introduction. Actually, there's a corollary to the story about the first six languages are the most difficult because there was the uh, that no, two students didn't laugh, and I discovered I think one was from Latvia, the other one was from Estonia. They knew eight languages each already, and they had no idea what I was talking about. But um, very nice to be back in the school, very nice to be back in Rome, and a great pleasure for me to be able to present work in progress, because then um, appreciate comments and very often incorporate them into the book afterwards. Well, in the last few decades, scholars have been taking an increasing interest in the history of knowledge. A trickle of books in the 80s, um, the river begins in the 90s, something like a flood after the year 2000. Why? Well, <coughs> to explain trends in historiography look at what's happening in the present. Um, usually, a new approach to the past is a response to changes in the present and especially to debates about such changes. Think of the history of the environment, which is much booming more than the history of knowledge. But debates about the knowledge economy, the information society, and so on, have encouraged historians to ask, ask themselves whether there was something similar in the past. Anxieties about the flood of information uh, are not new. Um, even if the problems in past centuries were not quite the same and the solutions still more different. So, crisis of knowledge. I want to argue there have been at least three crises of knowledge since the end of the Middle Ages. One in the 17th century, one in the 19th, and another one today. Each of the crises has been concerned with the problem of information overload. It's, and each one is linked to a revolution in communication. The first to the proliferation of printed books. I know um, Gutenberg is well before the 17th century, but the production of books accelerates in the later 16th, early 17th century. Second crisis linked to the rise of cheap print, not just books, but journals and newspapers. That goes with the steam press and with cheaper paper. And the third crisis we're experiencing today, and therefore there's no need to say more about it. It was in response to the second crisis in the later 19th century that universities were divided into so many departments, though nothing compared to the number of departments one sees today. In its turn, this specialization has provoked responses, notably the movement in support of interdisciplinarity, but also a certain growing nostalgia for the age before knowledge was divided. <clears throat> this no um, nostalgia has been expressed, for example, in three books about polymaths. 
Curiously enough, they all have the same title, The Last Man Who Knew Everything. But they're about three different people in three different centuries. The first last man, you'll be pleased to hear because he lived in Rome for so long, is the German Jesuit Athanasius Kircher. The second, Thomas Young, a Cambridge Don at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries, I'm happy to say, fellow of my college, Emmanuel. The last last man, an American, Joseph Lady, mid-19th century professor of anatomy and natural history. <coughs> I wrote this text a, f um, a few days ago, um, but I think, uh, knowledge goes out of date very fast, and uh, I've seen a reference to the publication of a fourth book called The Last Man Who Knew Everything. This one is about Enrico Fermi. I haven't got hold of the book yet, but I'll have to modify this lecture to take account of it next time I give it. Now, the difference in dates between the four men flourishing between the 1650s and the 1950s suggests that we could do with the study of polymaths over the long term, not just biographies of individuals fascinating as they may be. So I'm trying to write such a book. It goes from the Renaissance to our own time. You may ask, why not earlier? And indeed, there'll be an introductory chapter about ancient Greece and Rome and China and medieval Islam and the West. But it's short, and it's short partly because biographical data for those periods is much thinner on the ground. So I feel I can do um, a more thorough job by concentrating on 15th century till the 21st. But I didn't want the book, don't want the book, to turn into just a portrait gallery, even if the portraits are often of um, absolutely fascinating and um, not infrequently eccentric individuals. Uh, I've been looking for a red thread through the labyrinth of biography. And what I think holds the story together <coughs> is the, the, the gradual division of intellectual labor. And as we, the world becomes, uh, well, as, as knowledges become more specialized, the polymath becomes endangered, indeed threatened with extinction by the rise of specialization. I nearly said the irresistible rise of specialization, but the process has been resisted. It's been resisted by attempts at collective interdisciplinarity, which would make a good topic for another lecture, but also resisted by individual polymaths, which is the story I'm going to try to tell today. So I begin in the 17th century, when the word polymath and the synonym for it, polyhistor, came into use in Latin, French, English, German, um, maybe other languages. I haven't found it in any others. By this time, scholars were beginning to be expected to contribute to the community's store of knowledge and not simply to pres preserve and disseminate it. <coughs> but all the same, this is the moment of maybe equilibrium. As in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, it was still possible for 17th century scholars to contribute to a number of different fields. And a few intellectual giants described by a Dutch scholar at this time as monsters of erudition, they stand out even in the 17th century for their extraordinary range. And it reveals something about us rather than about them that we remember most of these individuals for only a small proportion of their achievements. 
Isaac Newton was not only a mathematician and a natural philosopher. He spent a good part of his time studying uh, alchemy and chronology. Newton's rival in the study of calculus, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, is remembered as a philosopher, but he contributed to the knowledge of history, especially medieval German history. He had um, rather um, good theories about language families, which were proved right by later research. He studied law and theology. He was known in his own time as the great port of call for information about China. Only when his manuscripts were studied did people discover what an interest he'd been taking in astronomy, botany, geology, and medicine. As for Kirscher, he wrote about subjects as different as China, once again, ancient Egypt, especially his in attempt to interpret the hieroglyphs, but also acoustics, optics, language, fossils, magnetism, music, mathematics, and mining, to say nothing of his career as an inventor of, for example, the sunflower clock or the magic lantern. And a few women of the 17th century overcame the obvious obstacles pla placed in their way to become many-sided scholars, even if not exactly monsters. The Mexican nun saw Juana Inés de la Cruz, once planned to attend the University of Mexico dressed as a man. Uh, she didn't do it, she became a nun, but in a cell uh, surrounded by books. And in this cell, she produced works of philosophy and theology, as well as writing poetry, studying science, law, languages, and music. But still more famous in the 17th century for learning was a Dutch woman, Anna Maria van Schoeman, who listened, uh, she actually did uh, go to lectures at the University of Utrecht, listening to them uh, in a cubicle uh, next to the lecture room so that she wouldn't be distracting the male students from listening to what's going on. She was supposed to have known 14 languages. And there's a Roman example too, that is Queen Christina of Sweden in retirement. She again had this omnivorous curiosity and in, in so many disciplines. The age of these giants or monsters now appears to us to be a kind of golden age. But there was a dark side to it as well. Complaints about information overload and about the fragmentation of knowledge multiply in the 17th century. Uh, one of the most vivid testimonies comes from the Englishman Robert Burton. One of the reasons for melancholy he gives in that extraordinary book, The Anatomy of Melancholy, is the, what he calls the vast chaos and confusion of books. He goes on, we are oppressed with them. Our eyes ache with reading and our fingers with turning. The problem was not only the multitude of books, it was that more and more information was becoming available in 17th century Europe, thanks to two processes in particular. In the first place, the knowledge of Asian, African, American languages, histories, animals, plants, rocks, a byproduct of the age of discovery, not to say invasion of other continents. And in the second place, the rise of the experimental method on the rise of systematic observation, aided by the 17th century inventions of the telescope and the microscope, producing once again new worlds of knowledge. So uh, it was a lot for single scholars to digest. <coughs> like other forms of progress, 
what Francis Bacon called the advancement of learning had its downside. The fragmentation of knowledge about which some 17th century scholars are already complaining, notably the Czech scholar Jan Amos Comenius. Comenius and his followers dreamed of reuniting the fragments into what he called Pansofia, uh, and he believed that this knowledge of everything would lead to what he called uh, the reform of the world. So, uh, Retrospectively, the rise of those new words, polymath, polyhistor, it may not be a good sign, might actually be a bad sign. It's a sign that general learning, that's the 17th century uh, English term for all this, um, it couldn't be taken for granted. Nobody needed to call Thomas Aquinas a polymath, although he knew more than most other scholars, that wideness was taken for granted, but it couldn't be by the time of Comenius. And yet, polymaths didn't disappear. During the Enlightenment, some individuals still mastered oh, quite a number of disciplines, even if they didn't make original contributions to many of them. Maybe not to any of them. An obvious example is that of Denis Diderot. Diderot was able to edit the famous Encyclopédie because his own interests were encyclopedic. He didn't just edit those uh, massive volumes, he contributed hundreds of articles himself, not only on philosophy and literature, which one might expect from the rest of his career, but he also wrote articles on acoustics, biology, art, music, and the crafts. But the situation had really changed since the 17th century. In 1630, it was possible for one German scholar, uh, Joch Johann Heinrich Alsted, to publish an encyclopedia entirely written by himself seven volumes of it. But the Encyclopédie was the work of a team. 139 contributors have been identified and probably there were a few more. The articles being anonymous, um, it's difficult to be sure. I move now to the second crisis. In the early 19th century, signs of this second crisis became more and more visible. And the problem, once again, overload. Scientific expeditions were bringing back more and more information. Experiments were more and more numerous. And the um, drop in the price of printed matter meant the proliferation of, of newspapers, journals, as well as books all available in unprecedented numbers. So information anxiety uh, revived. Um, a, a vivid English example from the early 19th century, Thomas de Quincey, who was a, a polymath, at least um, a passive one in the sense that um, he wrote about a variety of subjects but didn't do original research. But he was haunted by a nightmare of a cart which would arrive in front of his house and disgorge hundreds and hundreds of books. So he, he was worried then that he could not keep up in his reading with what was being produced. The institutionalization of specialization in universities, mainly after the middle of the 19th century, may be regarded as a kind of defense mechanism it's building a dike to contain the flood of information. Unfortunately, the side effect is, to change the metaphor slightly, the, the building of walls which kept scholars in one discipline from easy communication with scholars in another one. The, uh, the campus of, universe, of a university became a kind of archipelago, 
with people living on their different islands. As I suggested before, new words are often signs of new trends. So one new word in the early 19th century, scientist, started in English in the 1830s, spread to other languages. Specialists in the study of nature were just beginning to separate themselves from specialists in the study of the humanities. At this time, the term man of letters, or of genre de lettres, it shrank in, in its meaning. It, it was coming to refer to an interest in literature, belles lettres, rather than a wider interest in learning. Another set of new words which started in French. Specialité, spécialiste, spécialisation. They start in the context of medicine. Not, that's not surprising because the medics began specializing more than people uh, um, in other professions. I suppose because it was relatively easy either to choose a particular illness to work on or a particular part of the body. But then the trend spread. And again, to cope with all this knowledge, in many disciplines, teams were replacing individual searches for knowledge, especially in the natural sciences. Scientific expeditions included not just one scientist, but specialist botanists, geologists, zoologists, astronomers, and so on. By the beginning of the 20th century in Germany, teamwork in the laboratory was so important, it became known as Grosswissenschaft, big science, a term that the Americans took up later. And the collective production of knowledge in this way was already being compared to the mass production of goods in factories. Now, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not arguing um, against specialization. I think it's inevitable. I believe that it's made many new discoveries possible, including many benefits to humanity. But what has suffered as a side effect is general education or general knowledge. And for this reason, I'd like to describe the rise of specialization with the metaphor of explosion, in the double sense, expansion, but also fragmentation. And even so, it's still not difficult to find individuals in the 19th century, individuals in the early 20th century, whose interests and knowledge ranged widely across the disciplines. Just quote two famous names, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud. It's true that Marx and Freud were not polymaths in the strongest sense, in that the sense in which Leibniz was a polymath. They didn't make major contributions to a great range of disciplines. They contributed to a few fields, in the case of Marx, it's connected fields, economics, sociology, history, philosophy. Um, in the case of F Freud, it's a bit uh, more various because he, he worked on marine biology, anatomy, and physiology before he moved to psychoanalysis. But apart from that, both Marx and Freud were extremely well-read individuals. For example, well read in the classics, which goes back to the educational system of their time, which was not yet hyper specialized. A few scholars were still able <coughs> in the early 19th century to make original discoveries in a number of disciplines. So I return to Thomas Young. Trained in medicine, his interests expanded to include optics, acoustics, and languages. He was making quite good progress in deciphering hieroglyphics when he was overtaken 
by a more specialized Frenchman, Champollion. No wonder then that his Cambridge colleagues used to call him Phenomenon Young. But still much more spectacular than Young were the achievements of one of his contemporaries in Germany, Alexander von Humboldt, a true monster of learning comparable with Leibniz. Humboldt's contributions to knowledge, many of them the result of his famous expedition to South America, 1799 to 1804, they include geography, geology, botany, zoology, anatomy, and astronomy. But Humboldt also wrote on archaeology, ethnography, and demography. That's the most spectacular case I can think of. But there are quite a number of 19th century polymaths, most of them remembered by posterity for only one of their many achievements. And my favorite English case is William Henry Fox Talbot, known to everybody uh, for his contribution to um, photography. But he made original contributions to mathematics. Tal Talbot's curve is named after him. He contributed to botany, two species are named after him. To, he contributed to um, spectroscopy and finally to Assyriology. He was part of that small group of Victorian uh, Englishmen who were deciphering cuneiform in inscriptions. But I have to say that as specialization became the norm, wide-ranging achievements began to provoke suspicion as well as admiration. Thomas Young published some of his contributions anonymously so that his medical colleagues and of course his patients didn't lose trust in his work. And Humboldt complained that some people said he was interested in too many things at once. And one has to admit that polymathy comes at a price. There are risks to this kind of career. <clears throat> One danger is superficiality. Descartes called Athanasius Kirchus, Kircher a charlatan. In other words, somebody who promises more than he can perform, like the early modern charlatani um, who were selling their miraculous medicines on the piazza. One has to admit that in certain respects, Descartes was right. Kircher claimed to square the circle, but he, didn't, he wasn't actually able to. He claimed to be able to um, interpret the hieroglyphs, but we know that um, he got them wrong, except maybe for one character, the character for water. But since his day, the, that term, charlatan, has been applied to many later polymaths. Uh, when I was a student at Oxford, one of the leading historians and one of the great medievalists of the 20th century was Richard Southern, a very gentle man. And yet, I remember hearing him describe uh, colleagues in the history faculty as uh, that charlatan. But uh, there's another danger to polymaths, maybe even greater, and that it, it, I want to call it Leonardo syndrome which means leaving projects unfinished because another idea or another approach seems suddenly more enticing. This happened to Leibniz and explains why he didn't publish on a number of subjects. It happened also to Thomas Young. And so now reaching the late 19th century, one might have thought that that institutionalized division of universities into more and more faculties or departments would mark the extinction of the polymath. It didn't. 
paradoxically, um, in the 19th century, polymaths became a new kind of specialist. That is, the generalist who specializes in connecting different parts of the fragmented world of learning. And polymaths could also be subdivided from this time onwards, occasionally earlier. I, I, w I want to distinguish at least four types. The passive polymath, <coughs> the clustered polymath, the serial polymath, whom I find the most interesting of all, and finally, the cultural critic. <coughs> the passive polymath knows about many things, but does not contribute to knowledge. I think a good example, Aldous Huxley. Huxley's originality went into his novels, but he was curious about many things. He confessed to re actually reading the Encyclopedia Britannica from the beginning to the end. And he used that knowledge in many essays and articles that he published. Um, but once, as I said, um, they weren't uh, really original. Second type, the clustered polymath who masters a few linked disciplines. In the 1950s, Linus Pauling was um, made in original contributions to physics, chemistry, and biology. And maybe he was fortunate to live in a period when physics and chemistry were moving closer together, physical chemistry, and chemistry and biology were m moving closer together, biochemistry. Or think of, of the members of the Frankfurt School who were maybe primarily sociologists or philosophers, but also well informed about history and uh, psychoanalysis. But let me now turn to the serial polymath, um, whom I name on the model of um, the serial polygamist, a nomad who migrates from one discipline to another. Take an Italian example, Wilfredo Pareto. Pareto began his career as a civil engineer. He worked for Italian railways at the time of unification. But he became interested in economics to the extent of being appointed to a chair in economics at the University of Lausanne. And at a certain point in his career, um, he wanted to move on from economics and he moved into sociology. The Hungarian Michael Polanyi was a physical chemist who became interested in economics and finally decided that he was really a philosopher. The Scotsman Patrick Geddes began his career in biology, but problems with his vision made it impossible for him to use a microscope. He moved on to geography and sociology, especially urban sociology. Now, I what's it especially interesting about serial polymaths? They seem to be the people who most often notice analogies or unexpected connections because they use the mental habits, the habits they acquired in their first discipline to investigate another. Pareto, for example, took the idea of equilibrium with him when he moved from engineering into economics and then into sociology. In his days as a sociologist, he div divided people into two groups, the conservatives, whom he called rentier, and the innovators, whom he called entrepreneur. So he taking over economic terminology to analyze a much wider set of social changes. Or again, Geddes practiced what he called biosociology. He tried to see the city as a whole, thinking in terms of an organism, and thinking also of an organism in its environment, that is, the ecology of cities, the relation between a given city and its hinterland. 
And, and the last of the different types, cultural critic, writing regularly for a periodical, because this, this is true in the 19th century with the rise of those famous cultural journals like the Revue des Deux Mondes, Edinburgh Review, Westminster Review, and so on. But in the 20th century too, this role offered a niche for polymathic essayists like Aldous Huxley, I just mentioned, and in the United States, Susan Zontag. Zontag was trained in literature and philosophy, but she only became famous when she left the academic world to write for a more general public in journals like the New York Review of Books. She identified as an essayist. She confessed once to an addiction to writing essays like her addiction to smoking. The essays filled nine volumes when they were republished. Of course, um, many of them deal with uh, one particular area, photography and film, but others were concerned with topics as varied as fashion, dance, illness, and the war in Vietnam. <clears throat> now, returning to the problem of the, the dangers of specialization, the, um, the counterpart to the dangers of polymathy, a way to focus this is to go back to the year 1959 and to the University of Cambridge and to a famous or notorious lecture given there by Charles Snow, a physical chemist who turned civil servant and finally novelist. In this lecture, Snow complained about the growing gap between what he described as two cultures, natural sciences on one side, humanities on the other. Uh, he was violently attacked for his remarks about the humanities by um, F.R. Leavis, the most famous literary critic in England at that time. But this dispute was not um, just um, an example of Cambridge Campanalismo. It was, a, it was a local example of a wider discussion. And it's interesting that um, Snow's ideas well, became the subject of books in German, Swedish, and Italian, showing that he had touched a raw nerve. <clears throat> and I believe he was essentially right about the existence of the gap, especially on one side, that is, the ignorance of the natural sciences on the part of students of the humanities, among whom I have to include myself. But on the positive side, some individuals in Snow's generation, he was born in 1905, some remarkable individuals were still able to cross the frontier between these two cultures in the strong sense of contributing to um, disciplines on both sides, not just knowing the second law of thermodynamics. I've got time, I think, for two examples of this. Uh, one is an Austrian, Otto Neurath, and the other a Russian, Pavel Florinsky. Neurath was, first of all, a philosopher. He was a member of that famous Vienna Circle. Then he was an economist, a, a socialist economist, particularly interested in planned economies, like war economies. Then he was a museum director. He was an inventor. And, but the reason I mention him is that he spent a large part of his life <coughs> in an attempt, rather like Comenius, whom he admired, to restore the, the lost unity of knowledge. Pursuing this goal by organizing conferences, founding a journal, founding an institute, and planning a new encyclopedia inspired by the Encyclopédie. As a refugee in Britain after 1938, he 
started to call his project the unity of science. But in German, it had been Einheitswissenschaft. In other words, um, much wider, unity of knowledge. He included the social sciences, and indeed, he included history in his project. <clears throat> As for Florensky, in a rather similar way, he wrote of himself that he saw his life's task was, to, was, it was to continue along what he called the path towards a future integral worldview. He's a remarkable case of a serial polymath who began his career as a mathematician. He went on to study philosophy and then theology, and he became a Russian Orthodox priest. In the seminary, he became interested in religious art, Russian icons. But like the geometrician that he had been, he focused on the representation of space in icons. So once again, um, that the habitus of one discipline affecting the way that he approached another. But mathematics also led him in a totally different direction, which was electrical engineering. This is the early USSR, 1920s. There's great enthusiasm for electrification, so much so some parents christened their daughters electrificatia. So um, this, uh, he was still an orthodox priest, but for some time he was tolerated by the regime because he had a contribution to make. He was arrested in Stalin's purges and later shot. But um, before he was shot, he was working in prison on a totally new topic, the production of iodine from seaweed. I jump now to the situation today. We're all too well aware that the gap that Snow lamented in 1959 is much wider. Increasing specialization has threatened communication between different kinds of scientists. So it's many cultures of knowledge now, not just two. And one might therefore have expected polymaths to have become extinct by now, along with so many other species in the world of today. And yet it's still possible to find a few individuals who've continued to resist specialization with some success. The late Umberto Eco began his career, as you know, as a philosopher. Actually, he wrote a dissertation on the aesthetics of Thomas Aquinas. But he moved from there into the study of languages and literature and art as forms of communication, which finally led him to the study of semiotics. This serial polymath, besides writing the novels that made him still more famous, was also a cultural critic, writing regularly, as you know, in L'Espresso and elsewhere, on a dizzying variety of topics from the Red Brigades to Candomblé. And another example of a serial polymath, this time a living one, the American Jared Diamond. <clears throat> Diamond was trained as a physiologist, but he had an interest in birds from childhood. And in order to study birds, he decided to visit New Guinea. While he was there, he developed interests in languages and anthropology. And somebody in New Guinea asked him the question, how is it that, that your country is so rich and our country is so poor? And that question remained with Diamond and he decided that he would do historical research in order to find the answer. And the, the, the first result being Guns, Germs, and Steel, published 1997, and the second, Collapse, uh, published in 2005. Of course, Diamond's studies of history 
have often been criticized by specialists. But what's interesting is they've also been taken seriously. Um, the uh, collapse um, stimulated a whole symposium where specialists on bits of his material um, commented one by one. Whether or not one agrees with the answers he gives, and many people do disagree, the questions that this outsider to history has asked have been not only original, but also fruitful. It's the function of outsiders, I think, um, to question the conventional wisdom. And it's easier for them to, uh, to question the conventional wisdom because in various disciplines, they are autodidacts. They didn't have the orthodoxy drummed into them either at school or university. And that brings me to the last um, area I want to discuss, because achievements of the kind that Diamond and Aker represent, even today, they prompt a big question. How is it that polymaths can, how, can, how do they do it? What makes them tick? It's a very big question, and it really deserves a very long answer, at the very least a lecture on its own. But I think it's such a big question, I, I ought not to evade it. And so I will give a short answer to a big question, which is that what makes a polymath, I think, is a combination of certain psychological qualities with certain kinds of social situation. It's obvious that polymaths need an overdose of curiosity, a drive to learn, to succeed, and a drive to work unusually hard. They need a capacity to concentrate their attention, a capacity that observers often mention, but they call it absent-mindedness, which is the wrong way around. That, um, they're absent-minded about the everyday life because their mind is extremely present working out one of their problems. And finally, they have that gift of drawing analogies and seeing connections between topics that other people, the specialists, thought were quite distant, separate from one another. Maybe all those qualities are timeless but different cultures do encourage or discourage them. Some Christians believed that curiosity was a sin. Others, particularly Protestants, emphasize the work ethic and the need not to waste time. I rather think that the idea of the Protestant ethic as formulated by Max Weber applies to polymaths as well as to capitalists. And if so, that would be extremely appropriate since Max Weber was a polymath himself and his mother was a pious Calvinist. However, for this combination of qualities to bear fruit, polymaths need to find a social niche. Humboldt was an independent scholar. He had enough money inherited to have lifelong leisure to pursue his interests, and he even had enough money to pay for his famous expedition to South America. D Darwin was a gentleman with private means, again, and his uh, achievement is not, in, in, um, all to be f not completely to be found within the pages of The Origin of Species. It's, it's spread over a number of books on a greater variety of topics. Universities have often offered a niche for polymaths, um, including these awkward people who decide in mid-career that they want to move from one discipline to another. Michael Polanyi at the University of Manchester, um, apparently, I think he, he must have gone to see the Vice Chancellor one day and said, um, I don't want to teach chemistry anymore. I'm really a philosopher. And they just moved him along the campus and changed his 
title. More recently, this is what happened to Jared Diamond at UCLA. Intellectually nomadic, but uh, the whole of his teaching career, Diamond has spent in the same university. But he began in the Department of Physiology, and now they've given him a home in the Department of Geography. Libraries offered another niche, I mean the post of librarian. Uh, Leibniz was, among other things, a librarian. <coughs> uh, another niche from the 19th century onwards, if not before, the cultural journal in which it's possible to publish on a variety of topics, and the fees are enough to uh, make a living. But these niche are at risk in the third age, uh, the age of the third crisis, um, our own digital age. <clears throat> the digital revolution has already led to information overload on a more spectacular scale than ever before. So much so that new measurements have been invented to talk about it. The mass of information one was once calculated in megabytes, but then in gigabytes, and then in exabytes, and still more recently in zettabytes, each measurement much greater than the one before, as the amount of information stored in the cloud increases. So how, how is it possible to handle all this information? How can we process it, that is, turn it from raw data into knowledge, which I think of, I think of the process of turning into knowledge as a kind of cooking. Uh, it involves processing, um, verification, com analysis, comparison, and so on. <clears throat> now, what makes the problem s serious is that this digital revolution coincides with another trend, less dramatic, slower, but very dangerous, and that is the gradual erosion of the social niche in which polymaths flourished in the past. Think of the post of librarian. Librarians have become managers. They now lack the time and possibly even the inclination to read the books of which they are the custodians because they have so many other things to do. Universities are becoming less hospitable to polymaths than they used to be. After all, teaching and administration take up so many hours of the week. If Paul Anya was at Manchester today, what would happen to him? I don't know. Cultural journals. Um, the New York Review of Books and the London Review of Books happily still exist, but they are losing readers, at least in their paper versions, and they're losing advertising. If they survive online, there's still a problem because um, polymaths need to be able to write long articles. And the longer the article, the less likely that anybody will read it if it's only available on screen. And you don't want to be spending your own money downloading all the time. So in that sense, I'm a bit pessimistic. It might be argued that the polymath belongs to an old regime of knowledge that is, if not obsolete, at least obsolescent. All the living polymaths known to me have left middle age behind. Jared Diamond has just turned 80. Bruno Latour, Peter Sloterdijk are 70. Slavoj Žižek, despite being an enfant terrible, is now 68. I can't actually think of any active polymath who was born after the 1950s. I hope this means that I missed something um, and if people have um, suggestions as to who I've missed, I'll be very glad to think about them. But all the people I mentioned, they're too old to have felt the full effects of the third crisis. So the great problem, 
will the digital generation produce its own polymaths? I certainly hope so, for within the division of intellectual labor, there is an extremely important role for generalists, those individuals who are able to perceive these unexpected connections. But we're making life increasingly difficult for these remarkable individuals. We're destroying their habitat. Just at the time that given the information explosion, we need them more than ever before. Uh, that's the reflection I want to leave you with. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.